Well, here we are once again at Anchor Bible School. We're glad to see you today. Are you ready for another day of study? Amen. Praise the Lord. So am I. I'm excited about what we're going to study today. And of course, we still have tomorrow. And then we have one presentation the day following. <clears throat> okay. They owe me one now. <laughs> <laughs> we were even up to this point. <laughs> Greetings. It's good to have you here at Anchor Bible School. Have you been having a good time? Yes. Praise the Lord. It's wonderful to study the Word of God, and we're thankful that you're here to take this class, this very important class, on how to study Bible prophecy. Now, what we're going to do today, as we begin, is finish what we left unfinished in the last session. We were talking about the ending point of the prophecy of the 70 weeks. And so we want to uh, finish this particular study on the stoning of Stephen, because basically what we said is that the stoning of Stephen in the year 34 is what ends the prophecy of the 70 weeks. Now, uh, we were at the place where the material says, the stoning of Stephen, the last straw. So go with me there, and we're going to finish studying this ending point for the prophecy of the 70 weeks. Now we must examine more closely the trial and condemnation of Stephen. As we have already seen, God undertook many covenant lawsuits. You remember we studied the covenant lawsuits, the structure, the way that they, that they functioned in Israel? And uh, there were many covenant lawsuits throughout the Old Testament against Israel. But an examination of these lawsuits reveals that they were not final. They were not definitive and irrevocable. In fact, the prophets usually called Israel to repentance so that God, in His mercy, could drop His lawsuit against them. But in the case of Stephen, this is different. There is a sense of finality when it comes to the experience of Stephen that is lacking in the previous covenant lawsuits that God brought against Israel. Stephen was taken before the Sanhedrin the highest earthly authority of the Jewish nation. It was the final court of appeal, the Supreme Court, if you please. There, in fine prophetic fashion, and in harmony with the covenant lawsuit pattern, Stephen presented his defense by appealing to the history of Israel from the time of Abraham till the coming of the just one. Is he doing the same thing as the covenant lawsuits in the Old Testament? He most cer he certainly is. He's telling the story of God's benevolent acts towards Israel. Now it's interesting that at the end of his discourse, the accused becomes the accuser. The Sanhedrin presumed to indict Stephen, but he ended up indicting them. I want us to read the denunciation of Stephen to the Sanhedrin. It's found in Acts chapter 7 and verses 51 to 53. Notice that he is the accused, but now he's going to become the accuser. He's God's lawyer in a court of law, and he's bringing this covenant lawsuit against Israel. This is what he says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the Just One, of whom ye have, been now, have now become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. Are you noticing the number of times that he says, Ye, your, ye, your. In other words, he is God's lawyer in court and he is accusing them of violating the covenant 
in spite of all of the benevolent acts of God. Now significantly, up to this point in his discourse, Stephen has spoken of the fathers in terms of our fathers. Now you can read verses 11, 19, 38, 44, and 45 in Acts chapter 7. And it's interesting that Stephen, when he refers to the fathers, he says, our fathers. But after these verses where he refers to our fathers, he suddenly begins saying, your fathers. I want you to notice, in good prophetic fashion, at first he includes himself as part of the historical patrimony of Israel, as did Daniel. You know, remember Daniel said, we have sinned in Daniel chapter 9, he included himself in the problem. But at the conclusion of his speech, Stephen dissociates himself from them by saying, your fathers. Notice also that Jesus made the same statement in Matthew 23 verse 32. Jesus also spoke to the Jewish leaders when he indicted them by saying, your fathers. In other words, Stephen could no longer in good conscience be in solidarity with literal Israel. In other words, he was distancing himself from the patrimony of literal Israel because he knew that after they killed him, they would no longer be God's people. The theocracy would have come to an ignominious end. Are you understanding this point? Yes. Also of great importance is the fact that Stephen, unlike the prophets before him, did not make a call to repentance. See, there's all kinds of interesting details in this episode in Acts 7 about the stoning of Stephen, different from previous covenant lawsuits. He did not make a call to repentance. This would seem to indicate that the Jewish leaders were beyond the point of repentance. They had made their final and irrevocable decision to reject the Messiah. This is indicated by the expressions that Stephen used in his indictment as well as the reaction of the Sanhedrin to his words. Notice that he called them stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and ears and accused them of resisting the Holy Spirit. He also accused them of betraying and murdering Jesus and breaking the covenant. There is no mention of future messengers or opportunities. The reaction of the leaders of the Sanhedrin is important because it reveals their incurable rejection of the Messiah. Instead of receiving the message of Stephen, who spoke with the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit, with uncontrollable rage, they gnashed on him with their teeth, and cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. This is Acts 7, verse 54, and also verses 57 and 58. Notice that the verdict was unanimous. The Sanhedrin, the governing body of Israel, was unanimous without a dissenting vote. They were all of one accord. The apostles were one accord on the side of Christ, and the Sanhedrin was of one accord against Christ. The apostles uh, were on one side and the Sanhedrin was on the other. The Jewish Sanhedrin made its choice. By stoning Stephen, they silenced the last prophet who would ever be sent to them. Truly, prophecy came to an end for literal Israel at this time. Do you remember yesterday we studied the expression to make an end of, of vision and prophecy? Well, this is the last prophet. Vision and prophecy came to an end, literally, for the nation of Israel when Stephen was stoned. But the prophecy of the 70 weeks indicated that vision would also come to an end at the conclusion of the last week. Not only the last prophet, but also the last vision. Did this happen as predicted? Was Stephen the last prophet who had a vision? Well, let's take a look. The answer is a resounding yes. Acts chapter 7 not only indicates that Stephen was the last prophet sent to Israel, but it also leaves no doubt that he was the one who received the last vision as well, the last prophetic vision. It seems, when you examine this story, 
that what particularly incensed the members of the Sanhedrin was that Stephen claimed to have a vision of Jesus in heaven standing on the right hand of God. Would that have been a vision? Of course. This was a vision for there is no evidence that any one other than Stephen saw this particular experience. The critical question is, did Stephen see Jesus as he was and where he was at that very moment, or was he transported in vision to the future to see Jesus as he will appear when he comes again? The evidence seems to indicate that this was a prophetic vision where Stephen was carried to the future to see Jesus coming as the Son of Man. And I'll interject here, do you remember that Jesus when He was standing before Caiaphas, He says that you will see the Son of Man at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven? In other words, Jesus also stated the same thing. He referred to the future, to Caiaphas when He was before the Sanhedrin. Jesus had said something similar to Caiaphas that enraged the Jewish Sanhedrin when He was condemned to death. And of course, here's the verse that I referred to. Let's read it, Matthew 26, verse 64. Jesus said to him, It is as you said, Nevertheless I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. As we have previously studied, Jesus taught His parables that when the kingdom should be taken from the Jews, it would be given to the Gentiles. This being the case, we should find an event to mark the end of the 70 weeks, which not only closes the door of probation for the Jewish theocracy, but also opens the door of the gospel to the Gentiles. Are you understanding this point? Amen. So the point, the, the, the ending point of the 70 weeks not only has to be the ending point for the Jewish theocracy, it also has to be the open door for the Gentiles. Because Jesus said the kingdom will be taken from you and given to a nation that produces the fruits thereof. So there's two things. Number one, the kingdom taken away and the king given to some kingdom given to somebody else. Does the stoning of Stephen fulfill this specification? Once again, the answer is a resounding yes. It can hardly be a coincidence that the ringleader in the stoning of Stephen was a champion of Orthodox Judea, Judaism, Saul of Tarsus. At the, this is the amazing thing. At the precise moment probation was closing for the Jewish theocracy, God, irony of ironies, had chosen His champion to the Gentiles, and that champion was present at the stoning of Stephen. Paul later reminisced about this experience with the following words. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death, and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence to whom? Unto the Gentiles. Interesting. The door closes when Stephen is stoned, but the door opens, and the champion that's going to go to the Gentiles is right there. So is the stoning of Stephen a significant event? Is that the closing? Absolutely. Now, let's continue. The sequence of events in Acts 1 through 11 clearly reveals that the stoning of Stephen was a watershed event. In Acts 1 verse 8, Jesus said to His disciples, this verse, folks, has the summary of the entire book of Acts. This one verse summarizes the whole book. What did Jesus say? But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, notice the sequence, in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Notice the ever broadening concentric circles in this verse. The gospel is preached, first of all, in Jerusalem and Judea. And you know what's interesting? The first six chapters of the book of Acts refer to events that took place only in Jerusalem. Acts 1 through 6 is Jerusalem. Then in Acts chapter 7, this is also happening in Jerusalem, it's the stoning of Stephen. And of course, Saul of Tarsus is present there. Then if you read 
Acts chapter 8 verses 1 and 2, the gospel goes to Judea. Let's go there and notice um, the book of Acts chapter 8 and verses 1 and 2. I didn't write this specific detail there in the sequence, but I want to read it now. Notice Acts chapter 8 and verses 1 and 2. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of what? Jerusalem. Of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So where does the gospel go now because of the persecution in Jerusalem? It goes to Judea, and it also goes to where? Samaria. It goes to Samaria. In fact, the, la the, the rest of chapter 8 deals with the gospel going to Samaria. So you see, Acts 1 through 6, the gospel in Jerusalem. Chapter 7, Stephen is martyred, and God has chosen who is going to take the gospel to the Gentiles. In chapter 8, the gospel goes to Judea and to Samaria. Then in chapter 9, the apostle Paul is converted on the road to Damascus, and in chapter 10, the message goes to the Gentiles. First with Peter, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so is the stoning of Stephen a watershed event? It is the crucial event in the book of Acts, in fact. Now the bottom of the page, it will be noticed that the gospel went to the uttermost parts of the earth only after the conversion of the Saul of Tarsus. In fact, it was Paul who took the gospel to every region of the Roman Empire through his missionary journeys. Thus in Acts 7, probation closes for the Jewish theocracy, and in chapter 9, the champion to the Gentiles is converted. That is to say, one door closed, and shortly thereafter, the other door opened. The official beginning of Paul's ministry is described in Acts 13, verses 1 and 2, where he and Barnabas were ordained to the gospel ministry. Paul and Barnabas then traveled to Antioch of Pisidia, where Paul preached a long gospel sermon. This is interesting, to the Jews in the synagogue. The Gentiles then begged Paul to preach to them. The next Sabbath almost the whole city came out to hear the word of God. This provoked the jealousy of the Jews, and they contradicted and blasphemed. This led Paul to say some very significant words. Words very similar to the ones that Jesus spoke in Matthew 21. Listen to what the words were. It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of? Israel, Jesus said. So Paul is going, going along with that. He says, the gospel had to be preached to you first. That's Acts 1 through 6. But then he says this, But seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Is that the sequence that Jesus mentioned? The kingdom will be taken from you, and it will be given to a nation that produces the fruits thereof. And so Paul says, Lo, we turn to the Gentiles, for so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Now to the final paragraph. Notice that according to Paul, the gospel was to be preached to the Jews first. And why was this? Simply because, as we have seen, 70 weeks had been measured off for the Jewish nation. But when the Jewish nation rejected the Messiah, by divine command, Paul and Barnabas turned to the Gentiles. Notice that the door of mercy did not close for individual Jews after the year 34 AD. This can be seen by the fact that Saul of Tarsus was converted after probation had closed for the corporate Jewish nation in the year 34. <laughs> so was Saul of Tarsus converted after the door of probation was closed for the Jews? For the Jewish nation? Yeah, so was the door still open for individual Jews? Yes. Of course it was. So uh, it is important to take into account all of this information about the stoning of Stephen because this is the event that closes the door to the Jewish nation as God's instrument to take the gospel to the world. And now the gospel goes to the world through a nation that produces the fruits thereof, that is, the Gentiles, spiritual Israel, if you please. So was this clear? Yes. Okay, very, very good.
this ends our principle that uh, Israel today is global and spiritual, no longer literal and local. Now we want to go uh, to uh, principle number 11. I'm going to skip number 10, as I mentioned, uh, because uh, we're going to uh, have to study some materials which was not distributed, uh, and so uh, we're going to distribute those materials later on today so that uh, you can study them, and then we'll be prepared to uh, study principle number 10. So we're going to jump to number 11 that does not require a lot of uh, reading material, and then we are also today going to do principle number 12. So the main thing that we want to study today is principle 11 and principle 12. Uh, principle number 11 has to do with how to interpret Bible symbols. And this is on page 26 of your syllabus, and uh, we're going to go through this material. It has several pages. Uh, it has principles about how to interpret symbols correctly within prophetic contexts. Now, let's deal first of all with some introductory matters. Bible study takes time and effort. We must search for truth as for a hidden treasure. You don't find treasures laying on the street. You have to dig deep to find treasures. And so it is with Bible study. And that includes the study of Bible symbols. The next point that I want us to notice is that the message of Daniel and Revelation is not hidden or concealed. In fact, the name Revelation means to unveil. So the message of Revelation can be understood and Revelation actually decodes the book of Daniel. In Revelation, the book of Daniel is open and unsealed. So the book of Daniel is actually unsealed in the book of Revelation. So we have to study both Daniel and Revelation together. Many of the symbols in Revelation come from Daniel. And so Daniel would be the source that we would have to use in order to understand those symbols in the book of Revelation. The third point that I want us to notice is that the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is not about dragons, monsters, mysterious numbers, and esoteric symbols. Its central focus is not end time politics or a treatise to satisfy our futurist curiosity. Its central purpose is to help us know Jesus and be ready for His coming by knowing what is coming. Incidentally, Martin Luther wrote commentaries on every book of the Bible except James, James and Revelation. He didn't write on James because he felt very uncomfortable because James said that uh, Rahab was justified not by faith but by works. And Abraham was not our father Abraham justified by works. And of course, Luther was fighting against a, a church whose system was based totally on works. And so, and so Luther, he says, you know, James, this doesn't, doesn't rhyme with what I'm fighting against. You know, James says that you're saved, that you're saved by works, that you're justified by works. And, and it just doesn't square with the idea that you're justified by grace through faith. What Luther didn't understand is that uh, James and Paul were not fighting each other. They were fighting two different enemies of the gospel. You see, Paul, when he says that we're justified by faith without works of law, he was speaking to people who felt that they would be saved by works. James, on the other hand, is fighting with a different enemy of the gospel. James is saying, hey, if you say that you have faith and you don't have works, then that's not real faith. So in other words, Paul is speaking of the root of salvation and James is speaking of the fruit of salvation. If you don't have the fruit, you don't have the root. And of course, Luther, he couldn't really uh, grasp that because of the battle that he had. And we can't be real hard on Luther because he was fighting a tremendous battle with a system that depended on works for salvation. He didn't write a commentary on the book of Revelation either because he says, I don't find Christ in this book. All I find is dragons and mysterious numbers and esoteric symbols. He said, I can't find Jesus Christ there. Of course, we can't be too hard on Luther because Martin Luther did not live in our time when the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation have been opened so that we can understand them. His battle was not to understand Daniel and Revelation. 
His battle was to reestablish the idea that we're saved by grace through faith. That was present truth in His day. It's not necessarily present truth in our day. Now, let's continue here. A special blessing is pronounced upon those who read, hear, and obey what is said in the book of Revelation. And I might say, of course, the whole scripture. Next point. We must be careful about the way we study the book of Revelation. There is a dreadful curse pronounced upon those who add or take away from the book. You know, it's a serious thing to study Daniel and Revelation. We better interpret the symbols correctly. Futurists and preterists don't realize the terrible curse that God pronounces upon those who add or take away from this book. It's a serious matter. In fact, let's read that text. It's found in Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and, and 19. Uh, and it says there, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. God says, you add, and I will add. Verse 19, And if anyone takes away from the words of the prophecy of this book, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. God says, you take away, and I take away. You add, and I add. So it's very serious. We must be very careful about the way that we interpret the book of Revelation and the way that we interpret the symbols particularly. Now the books of Daniel and Revelation to a great degree are saturated with symbols. In fact, Revelation 1 verse 2 has a very interesting word. It uses the word in the King James Version that God signified the book of Revelation. What are the first four letters of signified? Sign. In other words, the book of Revelation is written in sign language. <laughs> and the sign language has to be decoded. For example, if, if I do this, what does that mean? It means love in sign language. Would you ever be able to figure that out unless you had a way of decoding the symbol? No, you see, this is the symbol, but the symbol has a meaning beyond itself. Now, what is a symbol? Let's go to our next section. What is a symbol? A symbol is something that stands for or represents something else. For example, in our parlance of today, the lion represents what? Courage. The lamb represents meekness. The olive branch represents peace. And the cross represents Christianity. You see, one thing is the symbol, but you have to decode the symbol and see what it represents. The larger reality that it represents. You know, we frequently use symbolic language even in our everyday speech. For example, we say, ugly as sin. <laughs> That's symbolic language. We say easy as pie. I've never been able to understand why, where that comes from. Easy as pie. It's easy to eat. <laughs> but I'm not sure that it's easy to make because I've seen my wife make pie. It takes some effort. Maybe it's because it's easy to eat. I don't know. But you know the expression, easy as pie. We say white as snow. You see, snow is the symbol that points to a greater reality beyond itself. And we say, dead as a doornail. You know, and that is symbolic language. In other words, symbols are language that have to be decoded to determine what they mean in a larger sense. A symbol is a similitude. It is a comparison. It is an analogy. Symbols cannot be taken at face value. They have a meaning beyond themselves. The parables of Jesus are couched in symbolic language. Frequently, Jesus uses the words, 
like or as. The kingdom of God is like a certain individual. You see that all the time in the parables. So what is Jesus doing? Jesus is using symbolic language. Uh, let me just give you an illustration. Uh, we have here Luke chapter 18 verses 1 through 8. You remember the story of the widow that kept on coming and coming and coming to the judge because she had lost everything. Her enemy had taken everything from her. And she kept on coming and coming and coming to the judge so that the judge would do justice to her. And the judge for, for a while would not answer her plea. And finally the judge says, you know, I'm sick of this woman. She comes and bothers me. She pesters me all the time. I'm going to give her what she asked for to get her off my back. So, so the question is, what did Jesus want to teach with this parable? Well, you have first of all the judge. You have to find out what the judge represents. He symbolizes something. You have to figure out what the widow represents. You have to figure out what the delay is. See, you have to interpret each individual symbol, what they represent beyond themselves. And when you study this parable, and by the way, you receive one material uh, that has this uh, uh, development of this story. I hope you'll study that. Because this, this parable of Jesus applies especially to the end time. Because before this parable, you have Jesus talking about the second coming, and the parable ends by saying, When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith in the earth. And in between you have this parable. And so really the widow in this parable is symbolic of God's church. After all, she is a woman. But she's a woman in, di in distress because she has lost everything. So she represents God's people in the time of trouble that have lost everything. The judge represents God. You say, now how can the judge represent God? Because this judge says, oh, I'm just going to answer her pleas to get her off my back. Well, does God say, I'm going to answer the, my people's pleas just to get them off my back? No. You see, this is comparison by way of contrast. In other words, Jesus is saying, hey, if an unjust judge will answer a widow's plea because, she, because he wants to get her off his back, how much more will God give us what we ask because He loves us? Amen. In other words, it's comparison by way of contrast. So the widow represents God's people going through this severe time of trouble. People have lost everything. And by the way, there's another symbol in this story. It's the antirikon, the adversary. Do you know where that word is used, the adversary? Your adversary, the devil, goes around seeking whom he may devour. It's the same word, antirikon, in Greek. So who was it that took everything away from, from, from the woman, from the church, so that she would be left desolate? Ah, it was the devil. Who is going to take everything away from God's people at the end of time? The devil. Are God's people going to come to God and say, Lord, Lord, please deliver us. Absolutely. Is God going to answer the please immediately? Yes. No. No. There's going to be a delay. And Ellen White says that the delay is the greatest blessing for God's people. She says they need to develop their faith. They need to learn to depend upon God. And so this whole parable, once you understand what the widow represents, what the judge represents, who the antirikon is, what the delay is, you put all of the symbols together and now you know what Jesus wanted to teach with this story. Are you following me? This is symbolic language. We have to decode the symbols and find out what they mean in a broader sense. Now back to the material, each symbol has a literal meaning and a symbolic value. The literal meaning is, you know, the widow. But the widow has a symbolic value. She represents something beyond the literal, beyond herself. Sign language is symbolic language, where each sign represents a particular concept. Jesus used many symbols to represent Himself such as shepherd. Is Jesus a shepherd? Yes. Literally a shepherd? Yes. No. But is He like a shepherd? Yes. Of course He is. Now, what characteristics does a, shepherd, does a shepherd have? Well, you have to look at the characteristics of a shepherd to see why this type or this uh, uh, symbol is used to illustrate the work of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus is called the vine. I am the vine. You are the branches. You have to know something about growing grapes. 
I have, I have a Thompson seedless vine in my backyard. And last year we had a bumper crop. We would go out every morning and eat fresh grapes in the, uh, late in the summer. And, uh, you know, we have orange trees. This morning I went out and picked some Valencia oranges and I made fresh orange juice. You know, and, and so you have, to, you have to know what it means to prune the vine. You have to know about the vine in order to understand why Jesus called himself the vine. In other words, you have to know uh, the, the symbol first uh, in order to understand why that symbol was used to express a concept. Jesus said, I am the door. Why would Jesus say that I am the door? Jesus said, He is the bread. Jesus said, I am the way. Jesus said, I am the rock. So why would Jesus use these symbols? There's something in the symbol that points to something beyond themselves. And we need to know, first of all, what the symbol, the characteristics of the symbol, to understand why Jesus used the symbol to refer to Himself. Actually, all of the symbols, what they do, is they give us a different portrait of Christ. Christ is like a many-faceted diamond. Do you know what makes the diamond beautiful? All of the cuts. And so you have all of these symbols that point to a different function of Jesus Christ. And when you put them all together, you have a complete picture of Jesus. Now people in biblical times lived in an animated universe. Rivers, the sun, mountains, stars, trees, sheep, all had symbolic value. We have lost that in Western culture. We have very, very few symbols from nature that we use in the world today. But in biblical times, all of these things spoke of God, had lessons for Israel about God. We must distinguish between a live and a dead symbol. A live symbol is one which we use today and thus has a contemporary meaning for us. A dead symbol is one which was used in the past and has lost its value for present day persons because we don't use it anymore. In other words, we have to rescue symbols today because the Bible uses many, many symbols that we don't use today, so we have to discover how that symbol was used in biblical times and not impose some artificial meaning to that symbol that was not intended by the original writer. So a dead symbol is one which was used in the past and has lost its value for present day persons. Most symbols in the Bible are dead symbols in the sense that we don't use them anymore. This is why we must let the Bible give us the meaning of these symbols so that they can come alive in today's world. So far so good? Yes. Now let's ask the question, why does the Bible use symbols? Well, I have several reasons here. Number one, a picture is worth a thousand words. Have you ever heard that expression? Yes. yes, of course. Symbols are used instead of abstract language because the message is remembered longer. For example, take the parable that Jesus gave of the man who built his house upon the rock. <laughs> You know, Jesus could have said, you know, when difficulties come, stand firm, folks. He could have said that. And of course, how long would you remember that? Hang in there, folks, hang in there. Everything will be all right. <laughs> no, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus gave a story, a symbolic story. He says, you know, to what will I compare the kingdom of God? Well, uh, I'll compare him to a man who built his house upon the rock. And would the Jews have understood what the rock represented? Of course. They knew Deuteronomy 32, the rock is the Lord, and His Word, incidentally. Because the rock is the Lord and His Word. So they say, oh, that means to build upon God. And then the storms come and the floods come. And, and they beat against that house and the house doesn't fall because it's built on the rock. And then there was another house that was built on the sand. And if you read Mount of Blessings, Ellen White says that this actually happened literally in biblical times. People did build on the rock and when floods came the house stood firm. But there were some people that were foolish and they built their houses in places where when the rains came it flooded and the house was taken away. 
so people could identify with what Jesus was saying. And so you have this man who built his house upon the sand, and the storm came and took it all away. Let me ask you, would people remember this a lot longer, the lesson that Jesus wanted to teach? Of course. Every time that they went by a house that was built on the road, they, ah, I remember the lesson. <laughs> Every time that they saw the flood come and sweep away a house, they said, aha, uh -huh, because you built on the sand. And so, and so one of the reasons for using symbolic language is because symbolic language is remembered longer, and people, when they saw the objects, they remembered the teachings of Jesus. Furthermore, every time a symbol is observed, its meaning is remembered. Symbols are also used so that the message can transcend time and space. For example, if God had spoken to John about capitalism, communism, the United States, nuclear weapons, tanks, machine guns, he would not have understood the message because these things did not exist in biblical times. So what does God do? He gives symbols. Instead of saying communism, He says the king of the south. And of course Israel knew what the attitude of Pharaoh was. Who is the Lord? I don't know the Lord and I'm not going to let His people go. Ellen White said this is atheism. So when Egypt is mentioned, they would understand that. So when, for example, Revelation 11 speaks of Sodom, you know, that's a universal language. Because Sodom was characterized by crass immorality. And so Sodom is a symbol, and Egypt is a symbol, the king of the north is a symbol, the king of the south is a symbol. It's universal language that we can understand today that the king of the south in 1798 was France. And we can understand that the king of the north was the papacy. And we can understand that France was characterized by, by Egypt because, uh, you know, France discarded God. And we know that France, at least during the French Revolution, was crassly immoral. Immorality was practiced in the streets. And so symbolic language helps us understand things that transcend time and space. And we have to be very careful, you know, because, because uh, you know, some futurists, for example, that take the picture in Joel, where in Joel it speaks about the locusts, you know, in chapter 2 it speaks about the locusts. They say, well, the locusts are helicopters. Well, I think that you should allow the Bible to explain what locusts are, and not simply, and you ask, why, do the locu why are the locusts helicopters? Well, because locusts fly, and so do helicopters. <laughs> You know, that's not the way to interpret symbols. Symbols are used within a biblical con uh, context in order for us to understand in all time what those symbols represent. Now, final point here as to why the Bible uses symbols. Symbols are used to conceal the message from those who would oppose it if literal language was used. Isn't it right that Jesus used par he spoke in parables to hide the meaning from those who were not sincere and honest? Of course He did. Because He knew that if He came right out and He, and he said it, uh, His, his uh, mi ministry would have been in danger because they would have want wanted to take Him and kill Him before the time. And so Jesus spoke many parables where the Pharisees knew that He was speaking about them, but they couldn't put their finger on it because Jesus was using a symbolic language. <laughs> You know, we have also the experience of, uh, of Paul. You know, the Apostle Paul spoke about a restrainer in 2 Thessalonians 2. He says the Antichrist is ready to manifest himself. He's there. The mystery of iniquity already is here. He says only waiting until the restrainer is taken away and then he will manifest himself and the man of sin will be seen openly. He will unveil himself. Well, why didn't the Apostle Paul tell us who the restrainer was? Well, the restrainer, folks, was the Roman Empire. You see, while the Roman Empire ruled, the Pope couldn't rule. The Roman Empire and the Emperor had to be taken out of the way, which the barbarians did, by the way. And then when the, when the Roman Empire was taken away as the restrainer, then the man of sin, which is the papacy, could manifest its power because the previous power had been removed. Are you following me? 
Now why didn't Paul just come out and say, Folks, you know that, uh, that the Roman Empire is restraining right now, but when the Roman Empire is taken out of the way, then the man of sin will manifest himself. What do you suppose would have happened if Paul had said that? The Roman Empire would have said, uh, the Roman Empire is going to what? He would have ended his ministry a lot faster, right? And so the Paul, Paul says to them, you know what I'm talking about. But he does not clearly reveal it. He just speaks of the restrainer. Because symbolic language uh, is, uh, you know, it enlightens those who are informed, those who are wise, in the biblical sense of being wise. The wise will understand. It says several times in the book of Daniel. But the wise will not understand. So the language is coded language. Symbolic language is coded language that the initiated understand, but those who do not wish to understand or accept, they will not understand. Now, how do we interpret symbols? That's our next point. How do we interpret symbols? Well, we must go where? To the original source of the symbol to discover what the symbol means. Now, most symbols in the book of Revelation come from the Old Testament. So we must use what? A Bible concordance. Which is the best one? Strong's is for the strong. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Any, any Bible concordance is good. So we must use a concordance and what else? The marginal references to discover the original source of a symbol. There are some 2,000 allusions to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. That is amazing. The meaning of some symbols, however, are explained in the immediate context of the passage. You don't have to go to the Old Testament. They're explained in the immediate context. I have one example here. Revelation 17, verse 1. It says that the harlot is sitting on many waters. Is that explained in the context? Yes. You go to verse 15, and verse 15 says... The waters upon which the woman sits are multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. So the context itself provides the explanation of what the symbol means. And incidentally, we usually use, when we talk about waters, we always use uh, Revelation chapter 17 and verse 15. However, there are other passages which are even more powerful than uh, just saying that waters represent multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. Actually, when you read other passages, the waters represent multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples of individuals who are hostile to God's people. They're not just simply waters, because the harlot sits on the waters, she governs the waters, she manipulates the waters, and the waters want to slay and drown God's people. I want to take you, just to give you an example, of another text that speaks about the waters. Go with me to Isaiah 17. Isaiah 17, verses 12 and 13. Isaiah 17, verses 12 and 13. Notice the comparison here. The waters in Revelation 17 are not simply uh, lots of people. No, they are people that are hostile to God's people. They are enemies of God's people because they're instigated by the harlot to persecute God's people. It says there in Isaiah 17, verse 12, Woe to the multitude of many people who make a noise like the roar of the seas and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. Are you understanding the symbolism here? It's saying that nations rush like many waters. Verse 13, the nations will rush like the rushing of many waters, but God will rebuke them, and they will flee away. In other words, they're going to be dried up. And be chased like the chaff of the mountains before the wind, like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. So what is God going to do? He's going to dry up the waters. These raging waters, because they thunder, it says in Isaiah chapter 17. Let's go to one other example of waters. In Isaiah chapter 8, Isaiah chapter 8, verses 7 and 8. Isaiah 8, 7 and 8. This is speaking about the invasion of Sennacherib into the land of Judah. And of course he ends up surrounding Jerusalem. 
and it looks like Jerusalem is going to fall. And, uh, you know, they pray inside, uh, every, and, and the king, you know, he declares an emergency, and they plead to God, and that's when the angel comes and kills 185,000 soldiers in one night outside the city. Uh, but notice how the invasion is described. Verse 7, Now therefore, behold, the Lord brings up over them the waters of the river. That is, over God's people, the waters of the river. Incidentally, do you notice that, the, at least in the New King James, the word river is capitalized? Do you know why it's capitalized? Because this is a particular river. This is the river Euphrates. And of course, Assyria was in the region very close to Babylon. So the waters are flooding. They're coming from Assyria, from Babylon, to into Judah to flood God's people and destroy God's people. And Sennacherib says, what God is going to deliver you? And so they're pleading inside. And so God answers by saying, I will. So it says, now therefore, behold, the Lord brings up over them the waters of the river, strong and mighty. What are the waters? Let's notice, the king of Assyria and all his glory. He will go up over all his channels and go over, go over all his banks. <laughs> so what is the king and his, what, what is the king and what are his armies? A river. And what, are the, what is the river doing? It's flooding. It's going over its banks. Verse 8, he will pass through Judah. He will overflow and pass over. He will reach up to the neck. Let me ask you, when the water comes up to your neck, <laughs> it doesn't have much, much other place to go, does it? <laughs> I mean, this is a crisis. And then I want you to notice the symbolism here. That when, when the river floods, it sprouts wings. See, that's the dragon of Revelation 17. The dragon is the river. The, the armies are the body, of, the body of the dragon. And of course, the waters come from the mountains or the heads. It's, it's, this is exotic, exotic symbolism. That unless you go to the way it was understood back there, there's no way you can make sense out of Revelation 17. It's impossible. Without understanding this symbolism from back there. Because for us, these are dead symbols. They make no sense. So it says... He will pass through Judah. He will overflow and pass over. He will reach up to the neck. And the stretching out of his wings will fill the breadth of your land. O oh, Emmanuel. So, we must go to the Old Testament for some of the symbols, the meaning. Some of the symbols are interpreted in the immediate context. And there's another important point that I want to share with you, with uh, particularly having to do with the book of Revelation. And that is our next point. There are concepts and stories in the Old Testament that saturate the book of Revelation. There are four stories that we have to know backwards and forwards. You have to go back to the Old Testament and you have to study in their entirety these stories. Because Revelation is saturated with these four stories. Let's notice what they are. Number one, the Hebrew sanctuary. You cannot understand Daniel or Revelation unless you fully understand the sanctuary service. It's indispensable. And that's going to be our next principle that we're going to take a look at. Number two, the story of Elijah. The book of Revelation is saturated with Elijah symbolism. So you have to know the entire story in the Old Testament. Number three, the exodus of Israel from Egypt. Revelation in many places is saturated with, with symbolism that comes from the Exodus story. And number four, the release of Israel from Babylonian captivity. Particularly when you discuss the sixth plague, and we're going to cover this a little bit later on in this course. When you deal with the sixth plague, the drying up of the river Euphrates, you have to go back to the fall of Babylon in Daniel chapter 5. Because that's where it comes from. And so these four stories, you have to go back to the Old Testament and you have to saturate yourself with the details of these stories because they are symbolic of larger realities in the future. For example, 
in, in the Old Testament, uh, the literal city of Babylon was literally sitting on the river Euphrates, on a literal river. In the end time, the river and Babylon are symbolic. Babylon is a global system. And if it's global and it sits on the Euphrates, the Euphrates must also be global. Are you understanding the principle? But you cannot understand the drying up of the Euphrates in Revelation unless you understand the drying up of the Euphrates in the historical context in which it appears. So we, in order to understand symbols, we have to go to the source. And folks, let me say this. When I say go to the source, don't only go to the verse where that symbol is referred to. Because sometimes in Revelation, it will only give you a hint. It will give you like one word. And it, it would be a mistake just to study that one word in the Old Testament. What, it, what Revelation is saying is, hey, for example, it mentions Balaam. It says, go study the whole story. Because, because the whole story of Balaam is symbolic of this stage. Jezebel. Well, when you find Jezebel, what do you have to do? Just study Jezebel? No, because Jezebel had uh, individuals who were linked with her. The king, the false prophets of Baal. You have to include Elijah too, because Jezebel can't appear by herself. Whenever she appears, she appears in company. And so Revelation will say, Jezebel. So don't just study Jezebel. You say, now that's just a hint that I'm supposed to study the entire story, because the entire story is typological. Are you with me? So you have to study the entire story in the Old Testament, not just the word that is used in Revelation. I mean, if Revelation took the time to tell all the stories, we would have an encyclopedia. We wouldn't have a 22 chapter book. And so, and so what, the, what the writer does, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is give us a hint and say, hey, look, uh, here is Balaam. Now go study the whole story and then you'll know why this symbol was used in Revelation. So far so good? Now, let's deal with our final point. We have 58 seconds. Let me introduce it. <laughs> I can introduce it in 49 seconds. <laughs> it must be kept in mind that symbols are liquid. Does liquid take different shapes? Yes. Depending on the context in which it appears? Of course. That is, they take on a different form depending on the context in which they are found. Like liquid changes its shape depending on the container it is found in, so symbols do not always have the same meaning. They can mean different things in different contexts. And so, in our next session, we are going to take a look at some examples of the fluidity of a symbol. This is a mistake that many people make, is they, they, they think that a symbol means the same thing everywhere. And so they misinterpret passages from Scripture. So that will be our next point of study.